The following prescribed is transcribed. That thing gets heavier. Where? Oh, yes. Listen, the time has come for scary things like monsters, ghosts, and vampire wings, like horrible movies, all drippy and drooly, and horrible hosts like me, Bruce Cabot. Hey! Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome you to tonight's program and reintroduce tonight's guest, mystery coffin opener, the one and only Mort Sol. Welcome back to the other side. <laughs> things going in America these it's days? It's a lot like this. <laughs> I guess you all know that. Mort will be here later to talk to us, give us his sociological insights into whatever it is he gives you sociological insights into. But first of all, Mort, would you introduce tonight's feature? Just add a little bit off the card. I can only whatever. try. Okay. It says... Sven Gulli presents yes. Yes. Marjorie Maine, Les Tremaine, Claude Rains, Jean Crane, with Valentine Janicki <laughs> as the young Henry Kissinger. In Midnight in Moscow, or the five o'clock shadow that swallowed the Kremlin. What are you trying to say?
just what I needed to make me a well man. Terry Evans, if you ever do that again, I'll, I'll chloroform you, so help me. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, remember, it is the duty of a nurse to give a man the kind of medicine he needs to make him well. It's not the medicine I object to, it's the method of application. Oh, very well, I think I can stand another dose. Let's have a demonstration of your method. Proceed with the treatment, nurse. I'm afraid your case is hopeless, Dr. Evans. <clears throat> oh, hello, Dr. Maynard. I... <laughs> I thought you were at the hospital. Well, I, uh, I got through sooner than I expected. I came back to take care of a few things. I see. Well, if you can postpone taking care of them for a few minutes, I'd like to see both you and Miss Drake in my office. Yes, sir. Fred and I have been checking the blood supply record. It's happened again. You mean there's more of it missing? Twelve pints. I can't understand it. Why would anybody want to steal blood? I don't know. But I'm going to report the matter to the police in the morning. And Fred, I want you to put a lock on that refrigerator. Yes, sir. Well, I guess that's all. Oh, Terry. Yes, sir? I'm going to let you handle that McDonald case by yourself by myself. That's a pretty delicate operation. Have you any doubt about performing it? No, sir. Neither have I. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, doctor. Good night, sir. for you. My wants are simple, Dr. Maynard. Very simple. Blood. Blood? That's a strange request. I'm a strange man, Doctor. Don't you remember me? Your face is familiar. But I can't place you. Your choice of words is ironic, Doctor. Five years ago, you placed me. In the Brookdale Mental Institute. I wasn't insane. But who'd listen to me after Rufus Maynard, the great brain specialist, had given his learned opinion? You still don't recognize me? See, that refreshes your memory. Takes you back four years, doesn't it? To the night Dr. Gall and the house physician rushed me here from the Institute.
Except for a pathological brain disorder, he seems physically sound. He was physically sound, in perfect health. It doesn't make sense. There are a lot of things about Merckx that don't make sense. For example, why did he continually ask for blood transfusions? It was a fixation with him. And the main reason I had him committed to your institution, he seemed to feel that periodic transfusions would guarantee him a kind of immortality. You think there's anything in it? Nonsense. I can't help thinking that Merck's kept hidden some phase of his case history. Perhaps the autopsy will... Uh... Impossible. He must have had a premonition of his death. Just this morning, he gave instructions to have his body turned over to his brother for burial in the family mausoleum on their estate at Greenwood Knoll. Well, then I guess the case is closed. But you were wrong, Doctor. The case was not closed. But I saw your body. I examined you. You were dead. Unfortunately, one who has confined his studies to the problems of the living is not in a position to judge. To you, death is merely an absence of life. There is no intermediate stage. That is where we disagree. For I have discovered a world in between. A world of living death. In my former profession, death was an everyday occurrence to me. I began to wonder, would it be possible for a man to appear to be dead and still be alive? The thought fascinated me. It became an obsession. I gave up everything to find the answer. And at last, I found it. In the land of voodoo rites and devil potions, where your profession is no place. The Valley of the Zombie. You seem skeptical, Doctor. <laughs> And so was I. Until I tried it. Perhaps... If you... No. Well, I, I don't blame you. For once you've taken it, there's only one thing that will counteract its effect. Blood. So it was you who have been stealing it? Indirectly, yes. Now I'm here for some more. Quickly. There's no time to lose. Of course, of course. I'll, I'll phone the hospital at once and have the hospital. And have my affliction publicized in the newspapers and medical journals to be exhibited as some strange monstrosity before an amphitheater of prying experimentalists. Never. But I have no blood your type here. You wouldn't lie to me. You can see for yourself. The supply is in the treatment room. Then I'll have to take yours. I happen to know we're the same type. You'll have the pleasure of contributing to the cause of science. And I'll have the satisfaction I've been waiting for so long. My dear brother has finally gotten around to thinking about me. Why are you here? 
Why shouldn't I be when you fail me? I haven't failed you. Dr. Maynard was becoming suspicious. I had to wait for an opportunity. But you'd have got it tonight. Would I? And where would you get it? There's none of my type here. This is your type. I put it in this container to fool Dr. Maynard. <laughs> what? Why, what's so funny? I was just thinking how well you fooled him. I've sacrificed everything for you. I've taken one job after another, stealing like a common thief. But I'm not going to do it any longer. Uh, give me the police. I'd think twice if I were you, dear brother. Remember, you're implicated in this also. I'll tell him that you kept me under a hypnotic spell. For four years? So they don't believe me. I don't care. I'm not going to be a party to murder. I'll put you back in the grave where you belong. Police Department. Hello? Hello? Police Department. he was doing. Well, he wasn't digging potatoes. I'd better call headquarters. Car 60 calling headquarters. Go ahead, car 60. This is Tiny. We're at the old Greenwood Knoll Cemetery. We just surprised a guy trying to plant a stiff. It looks like a job for the coroner. RPC. Okay, stand by. Everybody, snap your fingers, or whatever you got. Close your coffin, lock your crypt, till the moon is bright. Don't go out in the day, till it's safe at night. Be careful when you fly. Fly high! Hey, up in. The sky. Watch for wind. Here's why. You'll take a dive and end up in Borwin. Borwin. Yes, watch Svenguli every week. Keep your fangs pointy. Hey, good. Carry your blood. It belongs to me. <laughs> yes, yes, music lovers. Yes. Svenguli again with the program that asks the question, why is Timothy Leary, huh? He say a book of peace for him. That's probably why. Listen, kids, how would you all like to see Svenguli do an impersonation, huh? Would you like that, kids? Yeah! Okay, all right, all right. Listen, got to clear the deck a little bit here. See if you can guess who this is Svenguli is impersonating. You ready? Okay. Who? 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 Ah! Who? 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 Who do you think it is, huh? Is it an uh, Indian doing a war dance in high heels? No, how do you say that without moving your lips? <laughs> you don't have any lips. That's probably why. Move your lips, will you? Okay, good. Uh, now you want to take another guess, huh? Anybody? I'll tell you, it's the first man on the sun. <laughs> get it? See? They, they watch, watch it, it. You but they it. don't get it! Get it. Yeah. It's fun. Okay, hold on.
gas station heard the guy digging and called us. When we got here, he took it on the lamp. Did you take a look around? Yeah, but there was no dice in this jungle. What kind of a guy was he? Tall, kind of skinny, wore a long black coat and hat. We were too far away to see his face. Well, it wasn't robbery because here's his bill folded with money in it. Rufus Maynard, M.D., 1609 Terminal Building. Hey, I've heard of him. He's a big brain specialist. Have you figured out yet what killed him, Doc? Strangulation by somebody with a pair of strong hands. How long has he been dead? I can't tell. What's the matter? Is it a secret? The body has been expertly embalmed. Embalmed? It's the work of an undertaker, isn't it? Yes, but anyone with a knowledge of medicine could do it. Well, this is something to work on. Let's go over to Dr. Maynard's office and see if we can pick up a clue that will lead us to this peculiar party that has a passion for pickling. Detectives from the Homicide Bureau. Who are you? I'm Dr. Evans. Who are you and what are you doing on this table? Well, I was taking a nap while the doctor was working. I'm Susan Drake. I... It's a funny place to take a nap, isn't it? Not so bad. I often use it. Oh, you come here quite often, huh? Yes, I do. I'm one of the doctor's nurses. Look, why all the questions? How'd you get in here? What's this all about? Are you sure you don't know? Know what? When did you see Dr. Maynard last? Well, about 8 o'clock when we left the office. Who was we? Miss Drake, Fred Mays, the chemist, and myself. Is, is there anything wrong with Dr. Maynard? Nothing that a little strangling and a shot of embalming fluid didn't cure. You don't mean he's dead? Oh, no. Oh, yes. We found his body about an hour ago in the old Greenwood and Old Cemetery. You said he was embalmed? Yes, and professionally. The man in the black overcoat was trying to bury him. Did you catch him? No, but we will. Where did you go when you left here at 8 o'clock? And Miss Drake and I went to the community hospital. I have a patient there in a critical condition. Where did you go from there and what time? Miss Drake's home for dinner, about 8.45, I'd say. Came back here about 10. I had some tests to make. Do you know where I can find this Fred Mays? Well, he lives at the Eaton Hotel. Have you any idea who killed Dr. Maynard? Not the slightest. Thanks a lot, Doc. We'll be seeing you later. Good night. Good night. Good night. Terry, I think those detectives suspect us. Naturally, it's their business to suspect everyone until they find the murderer. Dr. Maynard. I, I can't believe it. Well, that's quite a joke. You know, I was wondering if there could be any connection between his death and the missing blood. Whoever stole that blood could have come back here to steal some more and been surprised by Dr. Maynard. Let's see if any more is missing. Everyone seemed to like Dr. Maynard, so I can't imagine who would want to kill him. It's Fred. Give me a hand, Susan. What's the matter? Nurse afraid of a body? No, I, I just don't care for the way it was presented. Remind me not to look in my icebox when I get home. He's been embalmed, too. First Dr. Maynard, now Fred. Who's going to be next, Harry? That's what I'm wondering. We'd better call the police. No, wait a minute. Let's not be in a hurry about this, I think. I had a hunch it would pay us to drop back here. If this guy sits up and screams, I'll turn in my badge. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. No. 
No, 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 no. For the millionth time, no. I had nothing to do with killing Dr. Maine or Fred Mays or anybody else. You're more stubborn than my wife. Question you is like riding a merry-go-round all night. You wind up where you start. You mean the ride's over? Not by a jugful. Hey. Hey, where do you think you are? I know where I wish you were. I could go for some of that coffee myself. Until you say yes. All right. Yes. Yes what? Yes, I'd like some coffee. Why well, didn't quit your stalling now, sister, and tell us the truth? Your boyfriend's just confessed. He has? Yes, we got it all down here in black and white. Is that so? Well, whatever Dr. Evans says he did, I helped him. You're pretty smart, aren't you? Bring him in. Well, well, good morning, nurse. And how are all your patients? A little afraid, I'm afraid. Uh -huh. Listen, you two. Suspicion of murder is a pretty serious charge. And we're going to hold you two until we... his rich clientele. The chemist was wise, so they bumped him off, too. They've been in custody since midnight, haven't they? 12.15. Well, release him. But, Chief, you... This isn't for publication. The body of a cab driver, neatly embalmed, was just found in his taxi cab at the corner of 3rd and Whitmore. Another one? But that's nothing to let him loose on. They probably put him there himself. That's it. They hired the guy to drive him over to the graveyard. Then they bumped him off so he wouldn't talk. And then they parked his gun. The cab was left there less than an hour ago. Yeah, but he could have had an accomplice, couldn't he? That's why I say, let him go. Oh. I just convinced the inspector that you were innocent. You can go now. Go? But you just said that... I said you can go. But I don't understand. You just said that... Look, I've been arguing with you for eight hours, and I'm tired of it. Either you go, or I will. Isn't that too bad? We were just beginning to enjoy it here, too. Come on, Susan. Well, goodbye, gentlemen. If you ever need a shot of embalming fluid, uh, come up and see me sometime. A man has to be in jail before he appreciates what it means to open doors for himself. You said it. I'm certainly glad they're through with us. I'm not so sure they are. Why? The police are not freeing suspects in an unsolved murder case without a good reason. It might be a trick on their part to give us a little more rope before they hang us with it. You mean unless they find the killer, we're the most likely candidate to succeed? Mm -hmm. That's the general idea, so it behooves us to do everything in our power to clear ourselves. Dying is getting to be a habit around here. Hey. No wonder the cord's broken. It's been pulled out. Well, how do you suppose that happened? Well, it could have happened in a struggle. Nothing else seems to be disturbed. Well, it was no accident because the ends were stuffed neatly back into the bell box. What's this record card doing in the wastebasket? Ormond Merck. Nature's disorder. Abnormal pressure on the fourth ventricle resulting in manic depressive insanity. Committed to Brookdale Mental Institute October the 18th, 1939. Hey, maybe he's the murderer, an escaped lunatic. 
Died June... Died June 12th, 1941. For a minute, I thought we had something there. So did I. Must have fallen off the desk. I'll put it back in the file. Perry, listen to this. Body interred in mausoleum on family estate at Greenwood Knoll. Well, once they're dead, what difference does it make where they put them? But that graveyard where Dr. Maynard was found is at Greenwood Knoll. Hey, that's right. Maybe this card has something to do with the case after all. We have to go to the hospital right now, but when we're through, we are going to pay a little visit to the Merck's estate. Oh, no, we are not. This is something for the police to handle. Why, right, the police will laugh at evidence like this. Don't forget, we're number one on their hate parade. But, Terry, I'm no good at playing detective. I scare too easy. <laughs> oh! <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. I still think we should let the police handle this. If we go prowling around some strange place, we're liable to get in trouble. And we're liable to solve a mystery, too. You know, I think you're a frustrated detective. I am. When I was a kid, it was my great ambition. I saved up 150 bottle caps once to get a badge. Now we'll see whether I miss my calling. Heaven help me. We interrupt this program to broadcast a special bulletin. Dr. Lucifer Garland, staff psychiatrist at the Brookdale Mental Institute, has disappeared under strange... Dr. Circumstances. Garland? If anyone has any knowledge of his whereabouts, please get in touch with the police department at once. Dr. Garland... I was Garland talking to him only yesterday. ...of medium height, dark hair, and weighs 160 pounds. When last seen, he was wearing a dark suit, white shirt, blue tie, black shoes, and socks. We repeat... Please communicate with the police department immediately if you have any information concerning Dr. Garland's whereabouts. There's a connection between all this somewhere. And it's not a good one, either. Look, Susan, when we get there, you better drop me off and go on back to town. And leave you alone? Well, there's no telling what I might run into. Well, we'll run into it together. You might need help, and I'm good at screaming. There's a Greenwood Knoll gas station. We'd better drive in there and find out where the Merck's place is. There doesn't seem to be anybody around. There's a man under that car. Ah. Good evening. Good evening. Gas station's closed. I uh, don't want any gas, just a little information. Could you tell me where the old Merck's estate is? Merck's estate? There's no one living there. Hasn't been for five years. Well, uh, if you don't mind, I'd still like to know where it is. Interested in buying? Uh, yes, yes. It's on the street back to the gas station. Join the cemetery. Turn off's about a half mile up the road. It's easy to miss. Better leave your car here, cut through the lot. Okay, thanks. Well, you still want to go? No, but I'm going. All right. This is it. Shall we go calling? I'm really not in the mood. Locked. Maybe we can't get in, I hope. There's a pedestrian gate. Some of that flashlight. No, no, nothing doing. If there's anything in there, we want to sneak up on it. Unless it sneaks up on us first. Mm.
anyway, the, uh, as you know, the uh, following Sven Gulli, President Nixon will be on with Attorney General Kleindienst dialing for dollars. <laughs> we hope you're going to stay with us. And uh, I'll be advertising some products later in the program, followed by Betty Furness and Bess Meyerson, who will immediately discredit them. <laughs> now, as you know, uh, there's a group... A good detective always... A good detective always cases the joint first. What did you say? He always looks the ground over first so he won't fall in a trap. Traps? Yeah, it must be a compost pit where they make fertilizer. Oh, well, you better watch your step or they'll be making fertilizer out of you. Yeah. Closer, we'll both be wearing the same shoes. Scared us. If we did, some farmer's going to get curdled milk in the morning. Uh, uh, nice bossy. Uh, <laughs> What's this place? the mausoleum where the Merck family is interred. Yeah, let's have a look. No, Terry. Why not? We're not on a fossil hunt. We're, we're supposed to be looking for a murderer. Afraid of skeletons, eh? Coward, I don't see how you ever became a nurse. Well, I can't help it if I'm allergic to them. I don't even like a skeleton key. Oh, brother. That one's empty. So that one. Well, there's room for another gruesome twosome. Uh-oh. Somebody's been in here, and recently. Look at those footprints in the dust. I'm not anxious to put mine alongside of them. Let's go. Almond Lux, 1887-1941. Well, you can say hello, but I'm saying goodbye. Terry, Terry, Terry! 
Well, the field's very becoming to me. Oh, take it off! I'm afraid of a few cobwebs. It's not the cobwebs, it's the spiders in them. There, that's the best I can do. Now, look, hold this, will you? And stay put. Maybe Dr. Maynard was mistaken. Say, for example, that Mertz was in a sort of a, a cataleptic state, which only simulated death. It's happened before, you know. But the embalming was... How do you know he was embalmed? His brother claimed the body. He might have been in on the deception. The first thing you know, you'd be saying he's a zombie. Well, there aren't supposed to be such things. Terry, the door! right where they want us. Now, don't let your imagination run away with you. After all, doors have closed by themselves. Well, it doesn't take any imagination, though. We're going to suffocate unless we get out of this place in a hurry. Would you please stop talking? You're burning up all the oxygen. Susan, stand over here. Well, that didn't work. I thought maybe I could shoot the lock off. Well, what's next, Mr. Detective? Well, do you realize now you didn't miss your calling? Go ahead. I deserve it for dragging you into this. But believe me, if we get out of this, we're going to make a beeline for home. Be and buzz away from here. What do you mean? Quit now? I certainly do. We're just getting warmed up. Well, I don't care to get any warmer. I've had enough for one night. I'm not going another step. This was your eye. Yeah, in the first place. imagination, I'd write stories. And if I had your nerve, I'd head for that front gate by myself and not wait for you. All right, all right. Hello there. Sanguli again. Hey, and, dummy. Yes. What's that you're wearing? This, this is my, you ready? This is my old school tie. Get it? Old school. Three to three. That's my school. That's the other school. Okay, file that. Anyway, gang, cool it. Who knows what time it is? Hey, kids, what time is it? I asked you first. No, no, cool it. No, no. It's Sven Gulli song time, huh? Okay, here we go. Would you give me a little drum beat, Ray? Huh? A little bang, bang, bang. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. You don't tug on Dracula's cape. You don't let werewolves run loose. You don't borrow band-aids from the mommy. And you don't mess around with Bruce. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, go it, go it. Thank you, Bruce. And now, would you like to see more of tonight's feature, huh? No! I didn't think so. Well, we got no choice. And now, 
Let's get back to the sons of the pioneers, the daughters of the American Revolution, and the Knights of Columbus. <laughs> With, with, with Valent Cullet, with Valentine Jenicky as the talking squid in. No, oh, I'm sorry. Valentine Jenicky as Novotny, the talking squid in the great garbage man strike. Or they made us an offer we can't refuse. <laughs> you get it? Oh, 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 oh. Must have been some sort of a, a reception room. Yeah. I wonder what kind of business Max was in. to the business he was in. An undertaking establishment. Well, Merch was an undertaker, huh? This place gives me the creeps. Please, Terry, let's go before I become a fit subject for one of those pine boxes myself. This is horrible, Terry. Yeah, it's time we call the police. It's overtime. Come on. It's so right. <laughs> Johnny. He's only been knocked unconscious. Hendrix, Blair, you're okay. Did you get his number? Nobody ran over you. You were cold cocked with a club. Shall we caught up with you two at last, huh? Now, we glad. You're just the men we want to see. I didn't get that impression over at Clark Drive. Clark Drive? Now, don't act innocent. You two knew that we were tailing you, and you gave us the slip. It was only a lucky break when we found your car over at the gas station. Why, that's ridiculous. We didn't know you uh, were... We can argue about that later, Susan. Right now, there are more important things. Do you know who we found in the house? No, but do you know who we found in your car over at the gas station? The station attendant. And dead. Dead? Yeah. Yes, and embalmed. Now, who did you find? Dr. Garland in the same condition. Tiny, crawl up the gas station tell him to send over the other police car. You two show us Dr. Garland.
Calling car 63. 63. Calling car 63. 63 answering. Can't you hear me? I can now. This transmitting button sticks. We picked up the guy and the girl over at the old house near the graveyard. Blair said for you to come over as soon as you can, okay? This thing is stuck for sure now. If any calls come from headquarters, be sure and take them down. You can't do nothing but broadcast on this set. Cozy little hideout you've got here. It's not our hideout. Tonight's the first time we ever saw the place, and I wish I couldn't even say that. So this was the embalming room. The body's right there. Right way. Well, it was right there not ten minutes ago. Well, maybe he got tired of waiting and went out to get a short beard. This is no gag. Marks must have taken it away. Marks? Who's Marks? He's an insane man, criminally insane. This is his place. We learned about him from Dr. Maynard's records. We think he's the one who's been committing all the murders. Yeah, go on. He died four years ago at the Brookdale Mental Institute. He died four years... He died four years ago. She means he died according to the records. But he's not really dead because his coffin's empty. Look, I know this sounds crazy, but... Oh, no, no, it's perfectly logical. He died four years ago. Yeah. But he's not really dead. No. Because his coffin is empty. That's right. Just a minute. Well, so help me, I know one crazy guy there won't be any doubt about. His coffin's in the mausoleum right now. If you'll go out there with me, I'll prove it to you. I've always been a sucker for a sleigh ride. Let's go. Wait a minute. Hey, Tiny, you stay here with her and put the bracelets on her so she won't start to play hide-and-seek with you. Hey, what's up? You stay in front of us. This is really unnecessary, you know. I wouldn't try to get out of your sight in this place for a dozen pair of nylon. I'm just carrying out orders, lady. I didn't know. restricted without this key. First flick, another great riddle from the old riddle master. Here we go. Let's try it on Herman over there. Herman, listen. What has a handle, three wings, and cement? I don't know. What has a handle, three wings, and cement? Easy. It's a grill. A grill? A grill doesn't have cement. I know. I threw the cement in just to make that hard. Doctor said this coffin was empty. Well, it is. Uh, I mean, it was. 
Well, anyhow, that's not much as Dr. Garland. Dr. Garland? Dark hair, dark clothes, white shirt, blue tie, black. I think it is. Let's go back to the house. We'll throw a police cordon out and comb the place with a fine tooth comb. Where's Tiny? Where's Susan? Hey, Tiny, where are you? Susan! What's that? What's the matter with you? I heard a noise in there. I thought he was hiding behind a screen. He was behind a coffin. Where's Miss Drake? She's handcuffed to that cabinet over there. Merks, we've got to find... We'll search the house first. Wait. That's my car. Be careful, he's got my gun. Someone stole my car. Go and get him. They have their lights on? Yes. I don't see that tail light in front of us. Which way? It's anybody's guess. Oh, maybe they didn't even come this far. They might have pulled off the road and stopped. I know how to find out. Their radio's gone haywire and they're broadcasting all the time. We can pick them up on this one. That's their motor and they're not standing still. Now, if we could just tell which road they're on. Yeah, that's where we're stymied. What's that? Sounds like a railroad crossing bell. It is. Hear the train? They're on Clark Drive. Step on it. What could be making that noise? Some kind of interference. It could be that big electric power station on Valley Drive. So far, so good. Yeah, but we haven't gained on it very much. She helps me. No, my dear doctor. She's not mad. Unfortunately, some of my recent blood donors have been the wrong type. So I had to take advantage of your facilities. And your nurse very kindly assisted me. Now, if you gentlemen will step to one side, we will take our... Departure. Thank you. After you, my dear. Susan! C. 
Save your breath, doctor. She's no longer your nurse. She's mine. you woke up when you did. I think I need a drink. I think I need one, too. Let's get a zombie. Zombie? Oh! <laughs> The nearest bird bath. Uh, is, uh, what did you say? I said, Mark, can you direct me to the nearest bird bath? The nearest bird bath? Why, certainly. There you go. Oh, oh, <laughs> Mark, Mark. There you are. Okay. Right. Okay. Time once again for one of the real bright spots on the program. The, the end. end. Oh, dummies, no dummies. It's time for. <laughs> Ask. Ben Gooley, yes, here we go. And before our first phone call, not yet, I'd like you to meet our special guest of the evening, ladies and gentlemen. He just flew in from Africa, the Tribo Bird. Yes, 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 yes. Now, this, this is the, the famous Tribo Bird. Now, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, this little bird can imitate the sound of any animal in the, in the world. Get out of here. Any animal in the world, really. Unfortunately, does a lousy Jimmy Cagney. <laughs> Wait till I throw him, will you? Anyway, let's just check out the phone here for Ask Spendle. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, just as I thought. What? The, pho <laughs> the phone is tapped. <laughs> <laughs> the phone is tapped. Stop it. So, instead, our Ask Spengoli question will come from the old mailbag. Would That's you bring right, it? Spangoli. The old mailbag, huh? Let Terry... Okay. Yes? You forgot your grapefruit. Get out of here. There he is, the old mail. Well, let's see what we got in the old mailbag this, <laughs> this week. Sock it to me time. Uh-huh. Of course, your traditional... They forgot the stamp on that one. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay. Let's see here. Let's just pick a letter at random. Dear Svenguli, I'm very upset. Everybody ignores me. It's just as, uh, as if I don't even exist. If people don't stop ignoring me, I'll go crazy. Please tell me, how can I stop being ignored? Signed, ignore. We'll be right back. All right, you dirty wretch. Are you the guy who killed my brother? You dirty guy. You better go in that bathroom and come out.
brooding beauty whose parallel one would have far to seek stand California's high Sierras. Fisherman's paradise and hunter's haven where the defacing hand of civilization has fallen but lightly and nature's vestments are displayed in all her rugged primeval abandon. I'll have it fixed after breakfast. But I... Now, run along. You know I don't like anyone in my workroom. Did you sleep at all last night? Now, please don't ask silly questions. Run along. You're going to make yourself ill working night after night without rest. Why don't you go to bed? I'll have Celia bring you breakfast, and then you can sleep till... I'm fine. I'm fine. Now, stop worrying about me. Oh, Father, you're not going out now. I've got some business to attend to. Now, go to bed. It's too early for you to be up. Do as I tell you. Yes, Father. imagination you got, and on only two bottles of beer. I tell you, I saw it. Don't sound right know-how to me. There ain't no critters that big in this country. Oh, he's kidding. Three times the size of a mountain lion and got the tusks of an elephant. Ain't natural. Oh, you guys give me a pain in my eardrum. Why in places would I think of a cockeyed yarn like this? Man, I used to live in Texas. I've heard some mighty tall stories down that way. Folks take pride in outlying the other fella. Well, dang if I don't think you Californians... I'm a liar, am I? Oh, no offense, Mr. Wheeler. Texas lion, I mean. And Texas lies is friendly lies. That's all I was aiming to say. I was just gonna have some coffee. About seven o'clock this morning when I heard it. The darndest... Evening, boys. Fog rolling down from the peak. George, you know Mr. Wheeler? This is George Oakes, the game warden hereabouts. Yeah, sure, we've met before. Good hunting, Mr. Wheeler. All the kind you ever heard tell of. Yeah? Go ahead and tell George, Mr. Wheeler. He's the man knows all about this country and what's in it. Been herding hunters and game around here for now on to 30 years. If you think I'm gonna be laughed at by you birds oh, all over... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Wheeler. We won't laugh no more. Good joke? That's what these fellas think. Well, this morning, having coffee, heard the darndest roar off away, some animal. Took up the trail about a quarter of a mile. I was using my binoculars, and I saw... Yeah? What? What did you see? 
I don't know. <laughs> What's so funny? Three times as big as a mountain lion and tusks like old Jumbo. <laughs> Shouldn't kid these town hunters that way. Bad for business. Discourages them. Evening, boys. Good evening, Mr. Oaks. Driving up from the village? Yes, yes, on my way home. Meet uh, anything on the road? No, no, fog's getting a bit thick for anybody to be out, I suppose. See any game? What do you mean? Game? No, no, nothing, nothing, why? Oh, nothing, nothing. Well, be seeing you. Yes, good night, Mr. Oaks. Good night, Professor. You weren't on a spree last night, George, and was seeing things? You know me better than that, Andy. Come on and keep your eyes peeled. Ground's still wet. There should be some tracks around. I'll believe it when I see them. Hey, Andy. Look. By golly. Must be about the biggest mountain lion this side of Noah's Ark. Mountain lion, heck. I never saw a mountain lion look like that cat I met up with last night. What do you make of it? There ain't no such critter. I'd say the same thing if I hadn't seen it myself. It don't stand a normal reason. You know this country as well as me. Did you ever run across any such thing before? Can't say I have. Sheriff. Howdy, Tim. Mr. Oaks. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do about it, George? What's on your mind, son? What else could be on my mind? My cattle. I work hard raising them, and I don't aim to have no murdering mountain cat ripping their guts out every other night. Lose another steer? Fourth in less than a week, and I'm getting sick and tired of it. What do we got a game warden for if these marauders are going to roam the countryside at will and kill off a man's stock? We do all we can. Well, it ain't enough. If the game commission can't cope with the situation, raise the bounty on these varmints and attract civilian hunters. One thing I know, I ain't going to stand much longer Take for... Take it easy, son. Give me a few facts. You uh, ever catch sight of this cat? No. I laid traps for him, but he must be a whopper. Smashes everyone and don't leave hide nor hair behind. Been flirting with the idea of poison bait, but I'm afraid my own dogs might chaw on it. The surest way's a bullet. But you've got to get out after this critter. That's what I'm aiming to do. Wait it right now. Anybody wants me, I'll be in Los Angeles until tomorrow night. Los Angeles? What in thunder are you going to do there? The trouble's up here. Well, I might get a line on it there. Hi, boys. I believe you're looking for me. The receptionist phoned you were here. Dr. Harkness? Yes. Oaks is my name. Oh, glad to meet you, Mr. Oaks. Thank Come inside. Thank you. It looks as if you fabricated it quite recently. Yesterday morning. I must congratulate you on your zoological precision, sir. 
This is an extremely well-articulated model. Why the heck? I need it from the real thing. I don't follow you, Mr. Oakes. What in thunderation sort of animal is this thing from, Doc? Well, I'd say it was a, an extremely well-defined print of an extraordinarily large member of the cat family. A cat? With tusks? Tusks? Tusks. Oh, no, no, that's impossible. The only member of the cat family with tusks was a saber-toothed tiger. And he's been extinct on Earth for over a million years. You're kidding. Literal truth. We have a well-mounted skeleton of the species in that room outside. Extinct on Earth for over a million years. Conservatively. Then how come I met up with one only the night before last? And don't look at me like it was crazy, Doc. It's heaven's own truth. Night before last. Mr. Oakes, I'm sure you'll find your hobby stimulating. Really, this is one of my busy days. It's been a great pleasure meeting you. Now, if I can be of any aid in supplying you data to help you in your modeling, I shall be only too glad to. Dang it, man, don't treat me like a harmless crackpot. I am a state officer, and I aim to be listened to with consideration. You can have little to complain of my patience, sir. Heck with that sort of patience. It's the sort of man uses for kids and folks in their second childhood, and I ain't neither. And don't assume I am. I don't. Your actions say otherwise. What sort of nonsense do you think you can waste my time with? Pushing under my nose with a sober face the cast of a print of an animal whose very memory has been almost lost in time. And telling me you had a social encounter with it night before last. What do you take me for? A scientific feller whose job ought to tell him that nothing in nature is impossible or could be. I'm sorry, Mr. Oakes. Your statement is incredible. But your earnestness convincing. If you had an encounter with this beast, then you're the only human being in the history of the world who ever lived to tell it. It was on a lonely backcountry mountain road. I was in my car. The thing couldn't get to me. I blasted on my horn and scared it off. I see. Was the animal you say you saw anything like this? Spitting image. Mr. Oakes, I hope... I most sincerely hope you are telling me what at least you believe is the truth. As far as any truth in this fantastic subject may be, really. I... I swear it on the Bible. Obviously, there's some ready explanation. A simple scientific inquiry will quickly reveal, but... It interests me as a side reflection of my work. Would you like me to come up to your neighborhood over the weekend? You gonna let me take you home tonight? Maybe. Wouldn't want to see you going out alone with the boogeyman out there. Can't be worse than some of the guys who come in here with no chance of time. Thank you. Coffee, please. By the way, do you have any idea where I may locate a Mr. Oakes? George? Yes, his office said he was headed this way. He was, a couple hours ago. Say, Danny. Yes, ma'am. Did George Oak say where he was bound? Well, he's uh, checking up on some reports of deer shooting out of season. He drove up San Marco Canyon cutoff. I guess he's over the ridge. He's probably scouting around in the timber. Well, he probably won't be back for a spell. He must have left his car over at the old Elliott place. That's as far as he could drive. You couldn't miss him if you wanted to trail him. Thanks a lot, Danny. Yes, ma'am. He drives a small station wagon. See, that gives me an idea. You, uh, you two ought to know each other. <laughs> this lady's stuck here. Gasket on a car blue, and it's gonna have to stay blown until we can get a part up from Bishop. She was bound out to Professor Grove's place for the weekend. He rents the old Elliot place. Would you, uh, would you give her a lift if you're heading that way? I'd be glad to. How about my coffee? I don't wish to impose. Be delighted. Most kind of you. Not at all happy to be of service. Ruth Marshall's her name. Dr. Ross Harkness. Hunting? Possibly. Did I understand rightly you're planning a weekend up here? With my fiance. And if you ask me why an otherwise intelligent, charming fellow should bury himself up here, I couldn't answer you. Was that the Professor Groves the girl mentioned? Yes, anthropologist. Taught at the university. Written quite a bit, too. 
Oh, that grows. The evolution of early man in North America. Bloom. My, I must say this place agrees with you. Uh, this gentleman. Ross Harkness. I was coming to it, Dr. Harkness. Don't rush me. He was kind enough to drive me up here when my car got temperamental down at Webb's Cafe. Don't say I never bring you anything. <laughs> oh, don't mind her, Doctor. Ruth enjoys being outrageous. Won't you please come in? Uh, thanks, but I'm looking for the game warden. Is he here? Uh, that's his car, isn't it? Well, he's gone up into the back country and left his car here. No roads. He won't be back until sometime tomorrow. I see. And where's your father, darling? Los Angeles. He's speaking there at the Naturalist Society. I hope one point has been impressed upon you following this demonstration. A prehistoric man was not the ape creature so extravagantly sensationalized by Sunday newspaper supplement portrait. In this skull of the chimpanzee, notice the piece of black paper I place here over the site of the brain. Observe its size. From it has developed the largest brain known to apes. Compare it with the Java ape man. <laughs> a misnomer, if there ever was one. The brain is four times the size of the chimpanzee. This was a man and no ape. A man whose mentality <laughs> compares favorably with a great many persons. Circumstance has led me to associate with and to dress. Do I understand you correctly, Professor Groves? Are you advancing the astonishing concept that the mentality of primitive man compares favorably with that organ which a million years of evolutionary progress has developed in his modern counterpart? Let me assure you, for want of your own understanding, that modern man's boasting pride in his alleged advancement is based upon one hollow precept, and that is his ego. I suppose you have some scientific proof for your egotistic theory, Professor. No. Merely an awareness of the comic strip mentality which now debates with me. Help down, man. Size of brain. Cro-Magnon man. Size of brain. Neanderthal man. Size of brain. Impressive, is it not? And now for our glorious modern man, of whose species you all take such inordinate pride in being a part. Here is his skull. And here is his brain. Where is this devastating advance to Olympian mentality? May I remind you, Professor, that it is a long exploded theory that the size of a man's skull or the weight of his brain has any direct bearing on the quality of his intelligence. That you should think so doesn't surprise me at all. Whether your skull is thicker or your intelligence thinner, I can't determine. But, but Professor Groves, I must ask you to conduct yourself with at least a semblance of professional decorum. This is supposed to be a dispassionate meeting of scientific interest. We've heard you expound your somewhat fantastic and unsupported theories with considerable patience. But we refuse to be subjected to abuse when we disagree with you. This is my cross. The penalty of being born into an era of little men who are small even in their spites. You're creatures of paper, bred of an artificial culture whose dearest possessions is your prejudices and important only in the hollowness of your smirking vanities. Hypocrisy is your Bible. Stupidity is the cornerstone of your existence and dishonesty your human essence. As it is impossible to continue this discussion with Professor Groves present, I suggest we adjourn. Run, you mean. Tuck your fears between your legs and run from new truths. And Professor Groves, we must ask you not to invade these premises again with theories which charity compels me to state as an aspect of lunacy. Gentlemen, the meeting is adjourned. Lunacy, is it? In other words, you will never accept a new idea unless it is offered with proof. You have no vision, only sight. Small men, small views. You want proof, do you? Well, I'll give you proof. I'll show you such proof that no men have ever had.
I think I'd better call today. It doesn't look as if your father will get here tonight. If it won't cause you any inconvenience, I believe I'll turn in, too. Poor girl. Deaf mute. Celia will show you to your room, Doctor. Thanks so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Doctor. must have decided to stay in the city. No. Celia tells me he returned early this morning before dawn. His car's in the shed, but his bed hasn't been slept in. Well, speak of the old devil, and there he is. Oh, hello, Dad. Had breakfast? Eh? You shouldn't have driven all night. Could just have easily started out this morning after a good night's rest. Oh, I had some work to do. I had no idea we were entertaining guests. Guests? I'm your fiancé, remember? This is Dr. Harkness, Father. How do you do? Harkness? Yes, sir. He drove me up last night when my car broke down at Webb's Cafe. Your daughter was gracious enough to ask me to stay the night. Well, since it's now morning, I presume there's nothing to detain you longer. I'm sure Dr. Harkness would be more comfortable here than staying in one of Mr. Webb's creaky motel rooms. No doubt. But we're not running a public hostel. Please, I don't wish to trespass. I can understand the professor's irritation. I am an intruder. I don't mean to be rude, but I'm much too busy to be a good host. Well, it's kind of you ladies to defend my presence, but I don't think I should. You let me do your thinking in this case, Doc. <clears throat> well, more visitors. Need some life around this place. <laughs> Morning. Morning. Come to pick up my car. Oh, Dr. Harkness. Uh, Mr. Oaks. Fine. I was expecting to have to go back to Webb's Cafe to pick you up. I spent the night here. Any more adventures? It jumped a fawn last night, less than a few miles from here. It? What? They were talking about some local superstition down at Webb's Cafe. Surely there's no basis of fact in this. Afraid right, there's more than a basis, miss. There seems to be no sense in the world at all anymore. Oaks, you ought to be ashamed of yourself running around the countryside telling this preposterous story. It ain't a story, Professor. 
Ask the doc here. Good heavens, you're not telling me that a clear-thinking professional man gives any credence to this wild tale? Naturally not, until I'm given some proof. What I showed you in Los Angeles seemed proof enough to get you up here. Is that why you came here, Dr. Harkness? Mr. Oakes intrigued my curiosity, and I needed a little diversion. Those are my reasons, Miss Groves. The world's gone completely mad. Sometimes I think I'm the only rational being left in it. One person telling a fairy story and the other believing it. Have it your way, Professor, and let me have it mine. You ready, Doc? I'll get my gun. Excuse me. Morning. Stupidity. Stupidity is contagious. One person suffers from it and has no difficulty infecting the other. Well, at least a walk in the fresh air won't do them any harm. I wish your father wouldn't be so arbitrary. But it is ridiculous for Mr. Oakes to drag Dr. Harkness all over the countryside on such a fantastic expedition. It is, isn't it? Well, hello there, pedestrian. Madman Sven here with another A1 Hotsy Totsy abused car deal that's a positive steal. You ought to know. You stole it. Yes, let Madman Sven take you off your feet, put you flat on your back in this hardly driven. Factory reject, easy to own, tough to look at beauty. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Spiffy. Little fanfare for it, huh? 1942, Cosa Nostra convertible, yes. The Cosa Nostra, just look under the hood, and there's a hood. <laughs> Make them a deal they can't refuse, Spangoli. Yes, friends, <laughs> this is a car with everything. For example, come around here with Madman Svengoli. Listen to the radio in this car. Now, listen to that, huh? Yes, clear as a bell, turn off the radio. Yes, and of course, listen to the horn on this great beauty. Listen, one more time, we'll blow it, and there it is, huh? Horn, okay. And you're asking, has this car got a heater, you ask, huh? Hey, does that car have a heater? You betcha. Listen, how's this for? Let me turn on the heater here. It takes a second to warm up. And, uh, <laughs> oh boy, how's that for heat? A little more, play. okay. <laughs> yes, and for the hot summer months ahead, of course, stop already. <laughs> it's got factory air. Factory air, if yeah. you like, breathing air from a factory. <laughs> huh? <laughs> okay, listen, and check that. I don't know if you can see it through the smoke from the heater, but would you stop? Check the groovy ventilation system right there. Can you see that, huh? Look at that groovy, I can't see the cue cards. <laughs> uh, groovy Ooh. ventilation system, huh? Look how easily you can make the peace sign of cars with love it or leave it signs on That's it. right, Spangoli. And of course, car buyers, in the event of a breakdown, this car even has a jack in the trunk. Oh, gosh, Spangoli. Shut up, Jack, and stay in there, would you please? Now, Spangoli knows what you're saying, car buyers. How can I afford a car like that? Ah, huh? well, listen, if you're poor, that doesn't bother us. If you're down on your luck, that doesn't bother us. If you're just a little short of bread, that doesn't bother us. If you're being sued by creditors because you're thousands of dollars in debt, that bothers us. Huh? That bothers us. That's your life. And listen, Dingy, for customers who have no driver's license, so who have had their driver's license revoked, Madman Sven has a special service. It's called, we won't tell if you won't, <laughs> <laughs> yes, visit Madman Sven's Abused Car Emporium and Non-Union Dental Clinic. Conveniently located just out of the higher end district, 612 miles from downtown Yuma, Arizona. Yes, Madman Sven for yesterday's cars at tomorrow's prices. Madman Sven's Abused Cars, another marginally corrupt offshoot of Sven Gulli's STD Enterprises. STD, Chef, Trickery. And distributor caps. This is Madman Sven inviting you to come in today.
Look there. Broken spine. Looks like one clean blow did it. Here's where he waited. Deep on the critter from the top of that rock. Judging from the condition of the carcass, he must have killed just for the fun of it. Hasn't even taken a bite. Must have had the full belly already. Yes. But when he gets a bit hungry, he'll remember this kill and come back to get it. Sure as shooting. Then let's take out. Better than trying to hunt him down. Maybe a long wait. After a million years, <laughs> nothing could be. What I don't hear, that owl, those frogs, the wood mice, ain't been a peep out of none of them for over several minutes now. Can you still see that carcass? Faintly. Good thing there's a moon. Shh. No, oh, wait. Wait till he comes out of the brush. Wounded, he's worse than unharmed. Couldn't have missed. Keep your sights on that clearing. Take no chances. Give him a couple more. Let's go. Good heavens above. Believe me now. Size, color, coat, tusks. Adds up? Yes, it adds up to another incomplete impossibility. Pretty solid impossibility, if you ask me. But nature just doesn't create or destroy a species overnight. There must be some explanation for a phenomenon of this kind. While I can't for the life of me explain such an amazing throwback, there's one deduction we have to make. What's that? Well, if there's one of these creatures, it's only biologically natural to assume there must be another. A mate? Yes. What'll we do? Get help. I must have this carcass. It's the greatest find in zoological history. I want somebody else to see it, right where we bagged it. Two men might be accused of hallucinations. Three is a different story. I'll get him if he's up this early. Wouldn't worry about that. Here he comes now. Good morning. Yeah. Oh, good morning, good morning. Uh, getting an early start? You're up pretty early yourself, Professor. <laughs> Couldn't sleep. Professor, we'd like you to come with us. <laughs> well, thank you very much, but I'm not much of a hunting man. I prefer the uh, less vigorous hobbies. We're not going hunting. We've just come back. We'd like to show you the result. <laughs> well, I'm sure your pride and your prowess is justified, Doctor, but I don't share your enthusiasm for the outdoor pastimes. We need you as a witness, Professor. Eh? Witness, we bagged it. Bagged it? Bagged what, for heaven's sakes? A few miles over the ridge, that big cat with the tusks. A saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> Are you men sober? Sober as anybody could be who sat up hours in the mountains waiting for that critter to come back to its kill. You're out of your mind. I want you to confirm my identification of this animal. Don't be nonsensical, man. I'd expected to hear more intelligent remarks from you. Frankly, I'm at a loss for any. Very well, if you insist on this preposterous expedition. We'd appreciate it. Now, CPS. I told you I intensely dislike practical jokes. All I can say is I cannot determine now which I admire less than you, sir. Your humor or your wit? But it was... We left it there deader than a door nail. I can swear to that. Oh, come now, Oaks. You're a sensible man. Or at least I've always considered you such. Admit it was some practical joke which is misfired, and I'll call upon my charity to overlook this dismal escapade. Please spare us that lofty air, Professor. We brought you here for a purpose. I've no doubt of it. And I've already expressed my opinion of it. Oaks will bear me out. Whatever you choose to deny. The beast was dead. I'm positive. I wonder who could have moved it. You gentlemen have played out your shabby farce. I'd appreciate being driven home to breakfast. Everything has a logical explanation in science. I refuse to believe the supernatural. There must be some logical cause and effect to this, this unholy adventure. Reckon there must. Any ideas? Well, 
No. Go away. Please, I'm busy. What I have to say won't take long. You know I don't want anybody coming to my workroom. This is my first intrusion. It may be my last. What do you want? I want you, the man I once knew. The good companion, the cheerful friend. I want the happiness we once found each other. I want... What has come between us, Cliff? What is this unhappy work which absorbs you so much and is undermining your nervous system and making you such an intolerable saurian? I'm not aware that I'm any different than I ever was. You're not aware of anything, least of all me. You're ruining your health and heading for a nervous breakdown. Why, it's as plain as... There's a cat in that cage. What is this work you're doing? Why can't you confide in me? That is my business. Haven't I any right to share it? It wouldn't interest you. You... Oh, you old self-centered lover. Everything you do interests me. Everything you'll ever do interests me for the rest of our lives. If you can't trust me, who can you trust? I won't be laughed at anymore. I would never laugh at you, darling. Who would ever laugh? They laughed. That pack of thick-headed, egotistical stuff shirts the Naturalist Club. Lunacy, eh? Long exploded theories, eh? A lot they know in their stupid obstinacy, in their peevishness of mind and soul. It's here, I tell you. All here. After all this work, I've done it. I know I have. What? Done what? Cliff, what is it? The embodiment of my theories of memory stimulation. The reactivation of the dormant cells of the mind of man. Dormant cells? Man is not of himself. He's made of everything that has gone before. He's part of every ancestor he ever had back to the beginnings of his human intelligence. They derided me, those gentlemen at the club. They scoffed. Why, at least, couldn't he have admitted the possibility I was right? Man has lost nothing of his emotions from the dawn of his history. He's lost nothing of his greed, his fury, his savagery, his jungle rapacity. Why not his physical personality? All right. You, you, you deny me, too. I can see it in your eyes. They put it into words, but you're thinking it. Cliff, please, there's no need to get so... I didn't ask you to come here. I know, but... Please I... do me the favor by leaving. Cliff, get please. out, I say! Don't speak to me like that. Please. I don't pretend to be a saint. My patience has an end, too. I don't ask for your forbearance. I don't ask anything of anybody. I didn't ask you to hoist yourself on me in my house. All I ask is to be left alone. You're not well. Please come upstairs. We're leaving this place. It's no good for you. Cliff, I beg. You're no better than the rest of them. You're nothing but a vacuum of ego, swelling, ready to burst, thinking your own empty desires to be all that there is in life. But there are more important things than your puny adoration of self. And I, and I want you out of here. I don't wish to know you, Cliff. I'll leave. But if you ever want me, ever need me, you know where to find. Goodbye.
earth could have happened between Ruth and Father to send her off like that? He must have been very rude to her. She told me she was going down to Charlie Webb's. I'll drive down there later and try to patch things up, if you like. They must have had a quarrel. I don't blame Ruth. She's had a lot to put up with. <laughs> Where's the professor been all day? I'm getting worried. driving himself these last few months is enough to give anyone a case of nerves. I wish I could persuade him to see a physician, but he snaps my head off at the mere suggestion. Oh, I'm sure he's sensible enough not to push himself too far. At least I hope so. Folks. Good evening, Sheriff. Nice of you to drop by. Is Professor in? I'm expecting him. Anything wrong? I'm getting a posse together come daylight. Posse? What happened? Tim Newcomb was murdered. Oh, no. Body was found at sunset. Dog killed, too. Folks are getting mighty stirred up about it. Who would do such a terrible thing? We're aiming to find out. Any leads? No. Tim put up a terrific fight for his life. Backbone broke and his hunting dog tricks had her neck snapped. This is indeed frightful news, Sheriff. Father, I've been so worried about you. Well, this is more important. Uh, Sheriff, you say there are no clues? Nothing yet. Me and the boys are going out in the morning. Came by to ask if you'd like to come along. But I'd consider it my duty if I were feeling in better health. So you're beginning to admit you've been working too hard. Well, I'm afraid I picked up a little virus. I feel rather weak. I'm afraid I couldn't sit a horse for very long, Sheriff. I'm sorry to hear it, Professor. Well, let me know if there's anything else I may do, Sheriff. I was very fond of young Lucan. This news distresses me horribly. Uh, let me know how you make out with the posse. Sure thing. Well, good night, folks. Good night, good night Sheriff. Ghastly deed. Poor boy. Please, Father, have something to eat. No, 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 I'm not hungry. I'm going to bed. Your father really does look under the weather. into my body the largest dose I have yet dared, wondering what this amazing experiment would do to me. My transformation was complete within 25 minutes, the fastest period 
to date. Reconversion to normalcy was the slowest. Almost an hour. I was temporarily obsessed with the frightening thought I might never return. Forever to be clutched in the savage grasp of a million lost years. All my basic animal instincts were enlarged and inflamed. Power felt as if it were bursting from every pore. I gloried in my strength and ferocity. Modern man was completely subjugated, leaving only the irresistible instinct of survival and the hungry urge to kill.
Don't be afraid. I won't hurt you. again with our thought for the day. Ready for the thought for the day, huh? You show me a chicken with wheels, and I'll show you a friar truck. Oh, no, no. A friar truck. You get the humor? Get out of here, would you please? Oh, my God. And now, Zelda. <coughs> Zelda. <laughs> Zelda. Where were you? Well, honey, I was in my crypt reading a book by the light of my kerosene lamp. So don't you know kerosene is bad for I your... I don't put it in my eyes, eyes, dummy. I put it in the lamp. I see. It's bad for your eyes. That's my... Never mind. Okay, wait for the straight line, baby. All right, cool it. Anyway, Zelda, listen. Get back here, Zelda. I... I... I thought it would be nice. If you joined me in a duet, huh? I'd like to see you sing one yourself. That's true. I can't <laughs> sing a duet by myself, can I? Okay, here we go. And good luck to both of us. Oh, we ain't got a casket of mommies. Maybe our jokes are all crummy. But we'll sliver around. Stay underground. Side by side. 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 Edible Van men in our coffins. What if the lid should drop? If he don't fall often, we can watch our guillotine chop. Yeah! Oh, we don't know what horrors await us. Take it. Critics all underrate us. But we're here even though the ratings will show we just died. Side by side. side. Yes, sir. Funny how Charlie's food tastes so much better when you eat it out here under the sky. After that hike we took, anything would taste good. Now, how about those pictures you wanted me to take? Yeah, sure. As soon as I change. Now, give me another. Got it. You want to change now? Professor Groves? No, still asleep, I believe. Oh, here's Miss Groves. Yes? Oh, Mr. Oakes. 
No, father isn't well. He's in bed. I... What was that? Buck Hastings. This morning? Yes. Yes, I'll tell father. Yes, we'll be careful. Thank you. What's wrong? Mr. Oaks. He called to tell us Buck Hastings. He works for the forestry station. Murdered this morning. Murdered? He'd been beaten terribly. Someone with tremendous strength. His throat had been crushed in and practically all his ribs. The second in two days. Mr. Oakes asked me to warn Father about going out alone in the woods. Asked us all to be careful. They think it must be the work of a maniac. Oh. Good heavens! I'll get her. Have some whiskey ready. Drink this. No, please. Don't let him. No one can harm you now. You're quite safe. Please drink this. No. What happened? Who was it? Inhuman. He was inhuman. He was more animal than man. And then he ran after me. He started to pull me by my hair. And then... And then he... Oh, Nola, dear, don't be frightened. You're with friends. You're safe now. Who was it, Nola? Who was it? Had you ever seen him before? I don't know. I never saw anyone like that before. It was ugly. Ugly. His teeth stuck out like a gorilla. He looked like a gorilla. All covered with the hair. And the spittle running down from his mouth. Better get her to bed. Take her up to my room. I'll tell father. Celia will help you. Twenty-four ring twice, please. Hello, Webb's Cafe. Is Charlie Webb there? Yes. Hello, Charlie. This is Jan Groves. Yes, I heard about Buck. I'm sick at heart. No, that's why I called. She's here. Nola's with me. Y yes, call Dr. Fairchild and tell him to come over as soon as he can. Yes. Yes, thank you, Charlie. Get me Dr. Fairchild, Susie. All right? Well, keep trying every ten minutes, and when you reach him, tell him to go up to Professor Grove's place. Nola Mason, my waitress, is up there, and she needs him. Yeah, thanks. Nola heard that? Sounds like it. She went out this morning with Buck. I wonder if she saw anything. That's yeah, her day off. She should have worked. You think the same fellow that killed Newcomb done it, Sheriff? He's got the earmarks. Ain't nobody gonna be safe around here till he's caught. What are you gonna do, Sheriff? The young ones up to my place, they're so scared they won't come out from under the beds. Why, my wife and sister won't even step outside the house without a shotgun apiece. I'll put in a call to the state police. It's just too much for me to handle. Can't get nobody out on a full-scale manhunt. Fellers won't come along with their families unprotected. Well, you can't blame us, can you? No, I don't blame you. Well, so long, fellas. So long, long Sheriff. Sure. Jan, do you have any idea what sort of work your father's been doing in his laboratory all these months? No. He would never discuss it with me. I've been inside that room only once. He forbade me ever to enter it. And Celia, how did you get her? I mean, how did she come to work for you? Father found her in Bakersfield. She's Mexican, I believe. About two years ago, she was a charity ward. No family at all. 
And handicapped. She worked for us a short while in Los Angeles before we came up here. I see. Did you know that she was helping your father in his work? Or rather, being used by him? Why, yes. Oh, you did? Well, it was her job to feed and water his animal specimens. Occasionally, she cleaned the workshop, too. She seems very fond of father. Fond? Or perhaps terrified? I don't know. It, it's hard to know what she thinks or feels. Bring her to me. I'd like to ask her some questions, if you please. Yes, if you wish it. Now, here? Yes, now, but not here. Downstairs in your father's workroom. Oh, but I'm not supposed to. Please do as I ask, Jan. Believe me, I have the professor's best interest at heart, and yours even more. I'll meet you downstairs. Do you have the key? No. She does. Then have her bring it. All right. not to be afraid, and to answer my questions truthfully. She says we shouldn't be here, that my father would be very angry. Ask her why he used that camera. She doesn't know. Tell her I say she's lying. Ask her why the professor used her as one of his subjects. She says he never did. it now, too? She says she has no knowledge of how those pictures were taken. She can't remember. Still lying. I don't think so. She seems sincere. I believe I got the picture as far as Celia fits into it. Who? What in heaven's name? Not Celia. Celia. And that fearful, monstrous... Products of your father's work. The professor used that girl in his experiments. It's likely she may be telling the truth when she says she doesn't remember. He may have drugged her first. But... But what... What was he trying to do? And that strange-looking beast? The precise nature of his experiments, I don't pretend to know. But I believe I can guess the results. Your father's been... What are you going to do? That animal seems to have more than a visual acquaintance with this needle. Let's see for ourselves. Help me anesthetize it. Take this towel. But what do you hope to... Maybe we'll find out. Hold this while I drape the towel around the cage. Mine. It's probably the doctor. 
We'll come back. She'll suffer no permanent injury, I hope. The shock was about as great as any woman could be asked to bear. But uh, with rest, she'll be all right. I'll uh, make arrangements to have her taken to her home in the morning. Thank you. Don't mention it. If I may say so, there's a mighty lot of feeling about this over the countryside. Here tell that the regular troop of the state police is combing the mountains. They better catch that thing before any of our local boys do, if they want them in one piece for a judge and jury. Well, good night, folks. I'll show you to the door. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night, Doctor, and thank you. Good night. Downstairs. taken by that camera. Infrared photography. While the subjects were strapped unconscious on that operating table. Under the influence of the professor's injections. Then... Then that man... That murderer... That monster... She said... Nola said he looked like a gorilla. Covered with hair. The spittle running from his mouth. He... He is... In experimenting with animals, I have had my greatest success with cats. Although I've had, unfortunately, to destroy a fairly large number in the process. Unlike the canine species, which has compromised subserviently with man, cats remember their heritage. My first solutions were incomplete and toxic. The animals died. But when later one survived, after I had refined my labors, I alternated with further experiments on a human subject. Celia. The subject was female, and I only partially succeeded in reversion. I attribute my lack of complete success in this instance to some incompatibility between my formula and the basic female constitution. Then it was I decided to experiment on myself. But they'll kill him. They won't understand what he was trying to do. They'll shoot him down on sight. Not if we find him first. Where to search? Where can we start to look? Any place, as long as we're ahead of the police and the posse. Repeat, didn't hear you. Sheriff Andrews reporting in. Just finished combing through Four Mile Ridge with my fellers. Heading west for Judson's Peak. Over. Come in, Oaks. Come in. Over. Oaks reporting. Me and my group are still beating up the east slope of Hogback Canyon. Nothing else yet. Over. Carson reporting. Covered west section of South Lateral. Nothing down there. There's something down there. Stand by. Spotted something. Fugitive sighted. West section of South Lateral. Seen through glasses. Approximately two miles north of present position. All police units call. Order convergence on position indicated. Instruct sheriff and civilian posses to fan out in a circle behind our patrols. Yes, sir. All units alarmed. Stand by. Interrupting this program to relay a report from San Marco State Police Division that the fugitive, thought to be guilty of two brutal murders in that neighborhood, has been sighted by searchers. 
two miles north of Snake Ridge. Sheriff and civilian posse. You know this country better than I. What do you make of that location he gave? West of here. We'll have to foot it. Big country, but too small for that bird. We'll get him. There was blood around the spot where we saw him fall, but I don't know how bad he was hit. But that's almost a crime, too. Trying to kill a man without giving him a chance. What chance did he give Newcomb and Young Hastings? You don't give a mad dog the chance to bite you, lady. Suppose he's insane. Suppose he doesn't know what he's doing. Two innocent lives taken is enough, miss. Well, she's overwrought. These crimes have greatly upset her. Knowing the victims personally has been on her mind. Well, that's understandable. Most women folk over the countryside feel the same way. Gay Martin speaking. What's on your mind, young fella? Yeah? I'll tell him. Okay. That was Tyden calling. A couple of campers reported seeing someone or prowling around by Dawson's clearing. If it's him, looks like he's heading down mountain then. Well, there's nothing much we can do until morning. I better get on home if I aim to get started by sunup. Give you folks a lift? Uh, thanks, no. Car's outside. Just dropped in and got the latest news. Good night. Good night. Who are we going? Charlie Webbs. Charlie Webbs? I have a hunch. I only hope we can make it in time. If I'm right. Ruth! There he was. Larger than life. The ugliest, meanest looking thing I've ever laid eyes on. Tossed me through the air like it was a feather. Tossed me through the air like it was nothing at all. I had an awful crash on that tree. We found him lying there, out cold. Ruth, Miss Marshall, she's not in her room. The door smashed off its hinges. I reckon he got her, too. I called the sheriff as soon as Charlie told me what happened. He said there wasn't anything we could do to daylight. Otherwise, we'll be liable to shoot each other tramping around out in them woods in the dark. How you feel now, Charlie? Feel like I should have stayed in Texas. much brighter this morning. Hear the latest? What's that? Uh, doctor. Hello, doctor. They've got the killer holed up in a cave near South Ridge. Tracked him down early this morning with dogs. Ruth. Well, she's there. Is she all right? Well, she was, from what I heard. She called out to the men to keep away and not use their guns. May I use your car? Certainly. Let's go. As long as that gal's in there with him, don't know what we can do. If we try to rush him, he might do her harm. 
Best thing to do maybe is wait for the state police. Tear gas might drive him into the open. I say let's rush him. He, he wouldn't have no time to do nothing. Maybe we could smoke him up ourselves. Well, I'm for trying it. In there? Yeah. What about Miss Marshall? Got her with him. We figure on trying to smoke him out and trust to luck that she'll get away. It's too dangerous. Well, the only other solution is to get the state police down with tear gas. That's just as bad. You got any ideas? Let me try to reach him. Alone? That's a frightened human in that cave. Whatever he looks like, whatever he's done, one man might succeed with it, where a group will do nothing more than panic him. Well, if you want to stick your head in the lion's den, we won't stop you, just in case. Oh, Wallace. That'll be in the way. Hey, look! Get him. No, don't shoot. Flatten out, quick. We'll fire over your head. No, don't. Cover him. Ruth, listen. Edge him back to those rocks, then tell him to run. It's his only chance. He'll kill him otherwise. Watch it, fellas. Don't fire. You might hit the girl. Let's go. Professor Groves was laboring to perfect his discovery. He experimented on himself. Here lies the result. We mustn't think of him too harshly. The things he did, and they were terrible. All of us are capable of doing when we give free play to the baseness, which is a part of everyone. He tampered with things beyond his province beyond what any man should do. And if it was madness, well, those whom the gods would destroy, they, they first make mad. Better. 